Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of King of Commercial Real Estate. And we have the king in the house, Dolph the Roos. How hey, are you Mike doing? Hey, Mike, I'm great, thanks. How are you today? <laughs> Super duper. And today we're going to talk about the process of leasing a commercial building. So we okay. just bought our building. We want to lease it. So what are some of the circumstances when a lease can be terminated uh, with one of our tenants? Okay, so you said we just bought a building, we want to lease it, and now you're saying, how can we terminate a lease? <laughs> so we've gone pretty rapidly. Um, firstly, I'd say I tend not to buy a commercial building if I still need to get a tenant. Mm -hmm. I'll often look at a building that is vacant and maybe get it under contract, which um, you know gives me a couple of outs if I can't find a tenant, for instance, or can't get the finance, and then I'll try and get the tenant. But I like to have a tenant before I commit to buying it. So if I've got my tenant already and then I've got the tenant in there, I can't think of any circumstances under which I want to get rid of the tenant and terminate the lease. I can think of plenty of circumstances with residential property. In fact, with many of my residential properties, I regularly have to terminate the tenancy agreement. And usually it's for only one reason. Hmm. It's not because the color of their car is wrong relative to the color <laughs> of the porch. It's not because of the language they use talking with me. It's simply because, you can probably guess it, they haven't paid the rent. You give them, where I live in Arizona, a five-day pay or quit notice. Mm. And if they don't pay in five days, we then have to go to court. It takes 15 days and the police constable turns up mm. and turfs all this stuff onto the front lawn. But other than that, I can't think of any reason why I'd want to get rid of a residential tenant. Um, unless they're cooking meth or something in the house, but <laughs> I haven't had that, and I don't know how I'd know if they did do it. Maybe I have had it, and I just didn't know. But um, that's not the case for commercial real estate, I believe. Well, with commercial, because they earn their income on the premises, it's very unusual for them to, um, to not pay the rent. Now, I have had it a couple of times, especially around the time of the GFC, mm -hmm. when some tenancies, one was a law firm, so that's a mm. bit astounding. Um, but I, obviously, they weren't doing well around the GFC. Um, but I didn't have to evict them because they did a runner on me. They ran away at midnight one night. I presume oh, no. it was midnight. I wasn't there to check out the time. But my point is, I didn't have to go through an eviction process. They were gone already. Oh. So it's, I've, I, I'm trying to think hard, Maitri. I don't think I've ever had to go through an eviction process of a commercial tenant. 99 times out of 100, they stay there till the end and they either renew or not. And the odd time where they've gone under, they tend to leave. I've never had a squatter in a commercial building. And I feel like uh, it also, it's, uh, in the case of commercial real estate, it's more secure as a landlord because you know that your tenants are always going to be there. So it... It's not like you're going to be looking for more tenants later on because they already have a, a really long lease. So it, it kind of gives us some security. Um, now, uh, in the case of the insurance, because I know that there's quite a bit of the expenses that have to be covered by the property owner and also for the tenant. In the case of the property's insurance, who is in charge of covering that? Well, it's an interesting point you mentioned because, again, drawing an analogy with residential property, yeah. with residential, the tenant pays rent and it's just rent to occupy the space. And from that rent collected by the landlord, it's the landlord who pays expenses like the property taxes, insurance on the building and maintenance. But when it comes to commercial real estate, it's very common for commercial leases all over the Western world to be what's called triple net leases. And we discussed this one day, Marjorie, and what we mean by that is the rent is net of property taxes, insurance and maintenance, meaning the tenant pays those items in addition to paying a base rent. So with many commercial properties, it is the tenants who pay the insurance on the building, not the landlord. And um, that would be also variable depending on whether the insurance company decides to increase their rates or not. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. It's variable. So um, I've got one building in Phoenix where I live. The insurance premium went up by 8% this year compared with last year. And then what I do is I do an annual budget of what the predicted 12 monthly costs will be. Mm -hmm. After I've done a wash up for the last 12 months, so I'm going to say last year you paid 14,600 in costs, but the actual costs ended up being 16,400 and it's 2,000 more. So here's an invoice for the difference. Or you paid whatever the numbers were, you paid 14,600 and it only came to 12,000. So here's a check for the surplus, 2,600. 
So we will do that. But yes, every year we adjust what they pay monthly to allow for any changes in the insurance premiums. And it's really cool that in your case, with the properties that you have, you split it into so that way you know for sure which amount is the variable one and which amount is the set amount for the rent. Yes, so what I'll do is instead of getting the tenants to cut one check or make one automatic payment for the rent and the costs under that triple net arrangement, I get them to write two checks. I have two automatic transfers. One is for the base rent and the other one is for that month's allocation of costs, property taxes, insurance and maintenance. Um, so that if ever the property taxes change and or the insurance and or the maintenance items, I'll give them a new invoice and show them photocopies of the invoices from the respective companies, like the insurance company, and that way they know that my base rent hasn't changed. It's just these other costs have changed, and they don't think that I'm sneakily trying to get some increase in rent out of them. The rent has stayed the same, and it will stay the same mm -hmm. until the next rent review. That's right. Uh, so with the rent review, do you mean like by the end of the lease period that they have? Well, no. Um, usually a lease has a duration. Let's say it's a 10-year lease. Mm -hmm. But then what you'll also have is rent review periods. And it might be stipulated in the lease that every two years the rent will be adjusted to bring it up to market. And an interesting concept in most commercial leases all over the world is that there is what's called a ratchet clause. Mm -hmm. And since I'm pronouncing it and not writing it on a board somewhere. <laughs> I want to point out <laughs> that the word ratchet is one word, ratchet, not two words, ratchet. <laughs> so there's a ratchet clause, which means the rent can stay the same or it can go up, but it can't come down. Hmm. And you might think, well, that's a bit unfair vis-a-vis -vis the tenant because if the economy crashes, why can't the rent come down? And the answer is that with a ratchet clause in the rental review process, hmm. Landlords can offer a lower base rent than they otherwise could if they had to allow for rents going up as well as down. Mm -hmm. So it means that rentals are far more stable in the commercial world than they are in the residential world. So they would kind of uh, have like a limit of how low the rent could go? Well, no, at any time, at any rent review period, say mm -hmm. the, the rent is, you know, $2,000 a month. Mm -hmm. That means that for the next two years, the rent could stay at $2,000 a month or it could increase but it can't go down. It will never go to 1900 or 1800 mm -hmm. Once it's gone up, it stays at that level until the next rent review. Oh, interesting. Uh, so um, also when talking about like the different tenants that you can get in a building, I know that most of them, they're going to request um, so for some modifications. Can a tenant modify the leased space by adding, let's say, a room or something like that just without your permission as the owner? You mean take an extra room that's already there or build an extra Building room? Building an extra room inside of that? Well, no, because they can't modify the building without the permission of the landlord. However, I've often had tenants come to me and say, can we do this? Can we do that? Mm -hmm. I think we talked one day about pulling down the front wall of a building and putting mm -hmm. a glass curtain in. So if they came to me and said, could we build an extra room on the side of the building? I might say, yes, if you get city council approval after submitting plans and architects drawings, and they approve it all, then you absolutely can build it. And the next step might be they say, well, will you pay for it? And I'll say, how much will it cost? And they'll say, 100000 I'll say, okay, but you'll pay extra rental in the form of X percent of that 100000 And more often than not, they'll agree to that. And that's kind of like some sort of uh, landlord-tenant financing situation that is going on. Well, it's stipulated in the lease. It's all part of the lease. That's why commercial leases tend to be quite long. I've had commercial leases that ran into 86 pages Oof. in length. Um, and not all of them are that long, but it stipulates just about every aspect of a potential situation that could arise. So yes, very often they want to expand the space and they want you to pay for it. So it's stipulated that if the landlord agrees to making improvements, the tenant shall pay X percent of the cost of that improvement mm -hmm. in the form of extra rent. Now you might say, would they be willing to pay, say, 6% of that 100000 to build the extra room? Yeah, for $6,000 extra, they might figure they can make another $20,000. They can mm -hmm. have another staff member or a bigger warehouse for widgets, whatever it is. So everyone wins out of that. And um, in the case of a tenant, I know that they have so many different requests that they can come up uh, to the landlord. But um, what about subleasing the area that they are currently renting? Can a tenant sublease uh, the space? <laughs> it's a that great they have? question. Usually, that is also stipulated in the commercial lease document. That's why they tend to be so long. Some of my commercial leases state that it is absolutely not possible for the tenant to sublease. 
any subleasing that they want to do has to be presented to the landlord, and then the landlord will decide whether to lease space to them, like take it out of the pool occupied by the current tenant and then give it to a third-party tenant. Other commercial leases I've got stipulate that the tenant is allowed to sublease mm. subject to the approval of the landlord. You don't want to have a bona fide tenant leasing space for you know, a dressmaking shop, and then there's a porn production facility oh, suddenly no. somewhere. <laughs> so it's all within, you know, bounds and, and reasonableness. And the cool thing is that all of that would be stipulated in the lease agreement. Correct. Now, yes. who is in charge of making the lease agreement? Because I know for all of us young investors, it can be kind of scary to draft an 86-page document. How do we go about doing that? Well, firstly, you'll be able to find, especially today, compared with 30 or 40 years ago, it is so easy. You go online and you just do a search on commercial lease document, commercial lease example. If you want to make it specific to your state, put in Utah or California or Arizona, wherever you're living or the country you're in, and you'll get examples of what conforms to all the local rules and regulations coming up there. Um, and then leases get modified. Sometimes banks say, all right, we're happy for you to collect the rent, but if you fail to pay us the mortgage, then we will go directly to the tenant to mm. collect the rent from them to make sure the mortgage is paid. And they do this to make sure that you don't decide to go on holiday and <laughs> for the next year you collect the rent but don't pay the mortgage. No, they want to jump in. And that's called a <laughs> subjugation of the rent in favor of the mortgagee who's the banker. Um, so yes, each lease tends to be a little bit different, but you can get sample lease documents anywhere. Talk with a few friends. You know, you become the company you keep. So if you're serious about getting into commercial real estate, hang out with a few people who might be doing the same. See what lease documents they've got. When you're seeing your dentist, say, hey, do you own this building? No. Well, yes. And I'm thinking of getting into commercial real estate. Do you mind if I have a look at your lease? I, mm. I don't need to know the numbers. You can black them out more often than not. I don't care if you know what I pay you. That's why I charge you $400 to do that root canal <laughs> so that I can pay my $6,000 monthly rent. No, people are getting pretty transparent about things. And just talk with more people. We're too scared to discuss things. Yeah, and I feel like um, there are so many people out there willing to help, especially like I never thought about like just asking my dentist for their lease. So like I'm definitely going to check up on that. Um, We're well, so talking about your dentist. <laughs> Next time you're there and you're in the dentist chair and the dentist assistant is saying, oh, hi, Marjorie, how are you doing? You say, well, I'm doing great. And what are you doing these days? Instead of saying, well, you know, just the usual, I go to work, and I go to <laughs> the workout training and all. You can say, well, you know, I'm really thinking about getting into commercial real estate. So if you come across a commercial building that you think might be a good deal, would you mind giving me a call? Hmm. No, Marjorie, honest question. What are the chances that your dentist's assistant is going to call you within the next three months with a potential real estate deal? You never know. You, or you, you never know. But yeah. I would rate the chances as extraordinarily low. But that's if you tell one person. That's if you right. tell the dentist a well and the receptionist on your way out and the person you meet at the whatever store you go to <laughs> um, and at the gym and at training and you tell 100 people, then you take that tiny chance times 100 and sometimes you won't be surprised anymore if three months down the track, someone calls you and says, weren't you the weird one that was interested in commercial real estate? <laughs> and you say, do you think I'm weird or is it weird that I'm interested in commercial? Well, either way, weird that you're interested. <laughs> but I found this building. My neighbor owns a shop. His father is retiring. The son doesn't want to take it over. They're selling it for a song because he wants to move to Minnesota. Why someone would want to move there, I'm not quite sure. No, I shouldn't say that. But anyway, <laughs> normally they move from there to somewhere warmer, right? But whatever the reason, if you put it out there, you may get the response. Just be bold. Tell people. And that's right, because it also makes you have a, such a great network of people that could be even looking for deals for you. Exactly. And there's another layer to it, too. If you keep it to yourself that you're into commercial real estate, then you're not reinforcing it in your own mind. And remember, we become our dominant thoughts. So if you tell enough people, I'm buying commercial real estate, <laughs> not I'd like to if I could ever afford it. No, I'm <laughs> buying. I'm in the process of buying my first. Haven't identified it yet, but I'm going to. Mm -hmm. If you keep telling yourself by telling the dentist assistant that that's what you're doing, suddenly you look for things, you'll see things that you didn't see before, and you'll, you'll have a greatly improved chance of finding something and buying it than if you didn't say that. What are some of the other uh, ways that you have grown your network uh, when it comes to uh, real estate investors in the same niche as you? 
Well, firstly, you've got to eat, breathe, sleep, and drink it, right? So wherever <laughs> I go, I'm thinking of it. I'm looking at buildings. I cannot walk past a real estate agent's shop window and not look at the photos and get an idea of prices, whether it's mm. residential, commercial, industrial, you name it. I'll stop and look. Um, even if I'm on vacation somewhere, I don't know where I go on vacation because I feel as though my life's va a vacation. <laughs> I'm not working now. I'm just sharing thoughts about something I'm passionate about that I do on vacation, right? <laughs> so to me, this is like a holiday, except we're not at the beach. Um, but maybe on the screen, we can get a beach scene. One day, yeah, so no worries. Day, we can yeah. do that, yeah. <laughs> or maybe we should look at commercial real estate on the beach. You know, mm. that's not a bad idea. Yeah. Um, you know, a boat storage place or something like that. But we have to be careful with beaches because of rising sea levels, right? But my point is, you've got to have an attitude that makes it all fun. If it's not fun, your mind won't sustain doing it. So make it fun. It's certainly lucrative. I don't think we need to talk anyone into that notion. And then talk with people wherever you go. You know, when, when they say, what do you do? Well, I do this, I do that. I'm into fitness, but I'm also into commercial real estate. If you ever come across something, let me know. And you'll be surprised which deals come out of the woodwork. What are some of the deals that you've gotten uh, from your network of other investors that you can think of? Oh, I was in Italy. I was running an event in Italy. I was talking with people that were into commercial real estate. And they said, oh, you should check out that hotel down the road. It was a 326-room hotel. It was in such a bad state of repair that the floorboards had all rotted away. Mm -hmm. But the government was offering a 300 million euro bonus or whatever you call it, subsidy oh, wow. to uh, renovate the hotel. So we ended up not being involved in that. But I wouldn't have found out about that had I not been willing to talk about it. I was in Japan. I was literally offered a commercial building on the island of Hokkaido. Mm -hmm. It's the northernmost island mm -hmm. that converted from yen was worth just on 30 million US dollars. Oh, wow. And they said, we will give this building to you under one condition. Hmm. What was that condition? Well, I said to them, <laughs> I'm very keen to find out what that condition is. They said, the condition is you've got to do something with it. You can't just sit on it. You've hmm. got to put it to some use. So okay. I had a team over there. We spent six months trying to figure out a use for this building. We thought of assisted living. We thought of an educational institution, a, um, a university or a polytech or something like that. And we thought of all these things and just couldn't make them work. And at the end of six months, I had to say, um, I respectfully decline your offer because we, we couldn't find a viable use. And that's the problem they had. But again, you've got to put it out there that you are willing to do these things. You're willing to look at any option. The, and yeah, I feel like also by putting it out there, you are truly believing in yourself as well as to be able to find those deals that are around there. Or create them. So the, the concept of coming up with a new kind of hotel came because I spoke with lots of business people who, like me, travel a lot. I travel an awful amount. I've spent, in the last 20 years, I've spent more than six years in hotels. Oh, wow. And that's not that much in a way. It's one night and three, or you might have two weeks at home, but then you have four nights in a hotel somewhere. <laughs> that averages out at, you know, one night and three. So that's six years in a hotel. So I know a lot about hotels and what works and what I find appealing and what doesn't work. And to me, room size isn't that critical. Do I like a massive big 3,000 square foot room? Yes. I was once put up in the um, in Vegas, which I told the Phoenician Hotel. Oh. And I had a three-room suite with a kitchen and two bathrooms oh, and well. a living room. And it was bigger <laughs> than my house. <laughs> right. Did I like it? Yes. I'm not going to say no to that. Do I want that? Do I covet that? No. Because more often than not, when I used to go to Vegas, because I was on a program there, I don't know if you're aware of this, to mm -hmm. buy 52 homes in a year without oh, using wow. any of my own cash. And all of them had to be cash flow positive, which mm -hmm. averaged out at one house a week. Oh, wow. Um, but So I used to fly to Vegas a lot. No big deal. It's only a 37-minute flight from Phoenix airtime. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, when I got to Vegas and I tried to book a hotel, there are 128,000 hotel rooms on the Strip. In fact, that one corner of Tropicana Boulevard and mm -hmm. Las Vegas Boulevard, it's where you've got New York, New York, mm -hmm. and Excalibur, and what used to be the Tropicana and MGM, MGM alone is 5,005 hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. On that intersection, you had more hotel rooms than the entire city of San Diego. Oof. It's just astounding. And yet, more often than not, when I'd go to Vegas, I couldn't get a hotel room on the Strip because it was full. Oh. And with average occupancies of about 1.6 people per room, that means that there were 200,000 people in Vegas, and 99% of them were there to gamble. 
Mm. And by the way, when you gamble, you've got one chance in 16 million of winning. And yet those 200,000 were all gambling for that chance. Hmm. And as I always say, the real jackpots in Vegas are out of the suburbs. Just buy a house. So anyway, getting back to the story, I couldn't <laughs> find a hotel room. So I had to go out to the suburb. I'd go to the JW Marriott, which is 12 miles away. And I'd have this magnificent, beautiful, big suite. But it's 12 miles from where the action is. Hmm. So I spoke with a lot of business people who, like myself, didn't care about room size. They wanted location. So I thought, is it possible for me to create a new hotel product where the rooms are so tiny that no other hotel would take it on, mm. but I could retrofit these rooms inside buildings right in the heart of the CBD of the target city? So our rooms were tiny. I'm embarrassed to admit how <laughs> tiny they were. But Marjorie, have you ever been in a hotel room where the bed is in the middle of the room? You can walk right around the bed. Oh. I have not. No. Mm. The headboard or the end the, the head end of the bed is always up against a wall, right? That's right, yeah. So my theory was why not just not only have the head of the bed against a wall, but have one of the sides against a wall mm. as well. And you might say, well, that's pretty impractical if it's a double bed, because that way one people in the one of the people in the double bed would have to climb over the other person <laughs> to get out. And my theory on that is if you're in bed with someone that you don't want to have them climb over you or climb over them, if they need to, then you shouldn't be in bed with them. So I thought that won't be a problem. In fact, let's make the foot end of the bed close to a wall as well, because oh, well. why do you need to walk at that end? You That's can only right. lose stuff there. So the rooms were very compact. We had a desk that was at the foot end side that went partially over the bed, but we had all these sockets that had every known voltage and frequency that you could mm -hmm. get, and we had 10 megabits per second internet into each room, which was magical back then, mm -hmm. and we, we, we just had facilities that were awesome. We had the highest occupancy rates in the industry. We had 92% occupancy rate when the industry standard oh, wow. or average was 68%. So it's coming up with a new product. It's thinking outside of the box. And thinking of the possible customers that you're going to be getting. That's exactly right. So if you can come up with something that is different for which there is demand, even if they aren't aware of it, because people, they didn't think they wanted these small rooms. In fact, they didn't prefer them, but they preferred a small room in the heart of town than a big room 12 miles away. And that was me. Then you don't need an Uber ride to get to your meetings. Mm -hmm. You can just walk. And you're in the heart of where all the restaurants are. Um, you know, even when I come here to the studio here, there's mm -hmm. a hotel that's walking distance from here. I've mm -hmm. often stayed there. It's just walking distance. And there's a hotel that's about two and a half miles away and what I guess is the downtown area of Proto. Mm -hmm. And I tend to stay there. Why? Because that's where all the restaurants are. And I have to eat, <laughs> you know, so either you leave your close by hotel to go a long way for a restaurant or you just be based there and you do all your activities there. So it's convenience. That's right. And I feel like that's the beauty of commercial real estate. As long as you provide the convenience that your customers need, then you already have your tenants. And that's, that's exactly all that it. matters. And that's the beauty of it. You can choose to invest in commercial real estate that is near convenient things or even smarter, you can buy commercial real estate that is cheap because it's not near anything convenient and you create those conveniences around it. You create the tiny hotel room that is not coveted, the tininess, but the fact that it's located at the heart of the CBD is. And then you provide other things to compensate. You never need an adapter. You've never forgotten an adapter because it's got every known plug and socket on it, including USB sockets. And now you also want USB-C sockets for those gadgets that use <laughs> USB. But it doesn't cost much to put those in, and it's a one-time expense. And word gets out, oh, my gosh, you don't even need to bring your own <laughs> brick or what's it called, little wall wall Transformer, Transformer yes. plug yeah. adapter thing. You just bring the cable. And now I've seen it. I've stayed in hotels where you don't even need a cable because most of us have wireless charging on our phones, mm -hmm. right? And you now yep. have desks inside hotel rooms where there's wireless charging. Just put mm -hmm. your phone here. It's got a little diagram. Mm -hmm. No cables needed, no frayed cable connectors, mm -hmm. nothing. It's, it's just, just a little it commodity. And That's it's a right. little simple thing. But if you're aware of that and you incorporate it, how many of our guests wanted the no cable charging facility? Probably one in 20. And maybe one in 10 thought it was novel and tried it and it worked. But if one in 10 used it and one in 20 wanted it and one in 20 used the fact that we had every known plug configuration mm -hmm. from around the world. And Americans who haven't been out much don't realize that the American spade type plugs we have, they're not universal. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, oh yeah, Japan has two that they, they don't have different size spades, mm -hmm. and in Europe they're the two round ones. And the earth might be a socket or a prong, and it's different in Belgium compared with Germany. You might say, well, that's one reason why I don't want to live there. <laughs> well, but I'll cater to tourists from that area with my hotels. It's all a matter of can you provide something for which there's a demand. That's right. Well, thank you so much again, Dolph. Amazing golden nuggets that you always give us. And thank you to our audience because now we feel ready to start in commercial real estate. Mm -hmm.